Okay. Some people in the back. Yeah. All right. All right, so today, obviously, our uh, topic is school bus, auto loss, uh, I items along that line. It's more focused so on school bus. So basically, what we're going to cover is, obviously, lessons from serious loss. We compiled our loss runs for three years. Well, that, uh, that'll come up. But a lot of what we talk about today is best practices and what you should be following. How many of us in here use third party for our transport of students. Okay. So a lot of us have this risk at hand then, right? All the other ones have school buses, right? Okay, so again, a critical portion of uh, this we'll get into with driver training, uh, what you guys have in place as far as protocols, you'll look at our losses, and it's uh, pretty interesting as far as where they are occurring. And it's probably pretty uh, straight across the board. So we look at this question here. How far should drivers scan approximately ahead on the road? What do you guys think? Is it A, B, C, D, or E? How many say A? How many say B? C? Okay, a few more. And then D? And I'm going to say right off the bat, it is not E, so we don't have to worry about that one. So those of you who said C were correct, right? In school, they always said, if you don't know the answer, go with C. So it is C. <laughs> 12 to 15 seconds. This is uh, one of the items that we have on our uh, safety net resources. Every quarter, um, our consultant, I believe it's Steve Dye, out of Jeff's territory down there, sends out a quarterly school newsletter. Various <laughs> topics in it, so preventing school data breaches, permission, uh, permission slips, waivers of liability, uh, student sexual harassment, transgender in public schools. So a lot of good topics out there that are available, and I believe uh, online has access to those as well and can send them out as well. So if we look back, way back in time, we look at some of the items as far as undesirable uh, school buses and how they used to transport students. Um, here, you know, it's almost looks more like a chicken coop than a school bus back in the day. And we go ahead in time, you know, you look back, have school buses really changed over time? <coughs> Not sure when that picture was taken, but it's, you know, same kind of design. Uh, obviously, the safety and design and development of these buses has gotten tremendously uh, safer for transporting of our students and kids. So, our focus today is a lot on our losses. And again, this is a three year loss history from the uh, sick codes within schools. So trending, we look at analysis over $10,000 in losses, and we'll look at that. Uh, serious losses defined as greater than or equal to $100,000 or more. And then auto losses, we had 89 of them. GL is 149. And that bottom one, serious losses accounted for over 57% of all of the incurred loss for expenses. All right, so quick chart here, again, three-year period for all of uh, Liberty National. So if you look at, this is GL, which is general liability. So 22% professional liability, 21% uh, sexual misconduct, a minor. Bus accidents, 14%. Pretty high number, right? Of that whole pie. Sports and playgrounds, slips, trips, and falls, and then bullying, uh, supervisor, and then other so lots of uh, variances on there. So this one here is focused on our auto losses, the incurred auto losses for obviously transport, transportation. So if we look at this, our leading uh, yellow category is FTY. And what does that mean? 
Failure to yield, okay, so 33%. And now if we look at a different one right above that, clearance distance and rear end collision, which is another 11%. So if we think about those two items, which is 44% overall, right? What is that telling us? What is that telling us? Are these preventable? If we look at that, that's driver error, right? And again, not knowing how these are classified, some of them may have been other drivers and maybe it's being still subrogated. I don't know how these were uh, rolled into this, but 44% is driver error. There's no excuse why someone should have a rear end collision. They weren't paying attention or driving too fast for conditions, right? So again, a lot of this would come back to training, same with failure, failure to yield, and then we're getting the other ones as far as uh, control, rollovers, non-owned vehicles, pedestrian strikes, and obviously that's going to be high, just lost dollars, and then uninsured or underinsured motorists is the next one. <clears throat> so looking at the design from those uh, pictures previous, um, we look at the design of the school bus. Over time, pretty safe, right? Bright yellow, flashing lights, um, reinforced sides, colorful, bright lights, flashing lights. It's hard to miss. What are one of the things we need to focus on is well-trained and screened drivers, correct? Because again, referring back to that, 44% of the driver. 44% ah, 44, 44 of the losses can be attributed back to the drivers. So trained in student behavior management, participate in pre-employment or random drug testing, um, frequent driving record checks, MVR checks, trained in loading and unloading, trained in security procedures, trained in emergency medical procedures. How many of us train our school bus drivers in all those subjects? How many of us listen to our kids' stories riding the bus to school? I do. And my daughter, obviously right now, she's uh, middle school, she says, Dad, guess what? We were driving home, our, our driver ran a stop sign. Luckily, it was in town, okay? I'm, a, I'm one of those parents that don't let my kids drive a bus if they go on a field trip to Chicago. I live up west of Chicago. I will not let them ride outside of probably about 10 or 15 miles of where I live. And again, it's just seeing what happens and what can happen. You know, obviously my kids get a little frustrated with me, but I'd rather keep them safe than uh, risk something along this lines. So some of the losses obviously that have occurred and we need to be aware of, obviously hail damage, but fire and flood. So six losses, one each from hail uh, and flood, and then obviously fire loss, arson-related property. So if we look at this, how do we store our buses? Pretty much every uh, yard that I see, they're lined up side by side by side by side, right? That's typical. So if one catches on fire, the chances of that spreading to the next bus pretty evitable, right? So in our, some do have storage areas. Is there separation between them? You know, some of the things we did look at and think about. Floods, um, how many of us look at the flood maps? So if there is a flood, you know, I hate to see all the uh, school losses, bus losses down in Texas and obviously Florida as well. So again, are they parked in floodplains? You know, we need to be aware of that. Here's another one here. We talked about separation, uh, segregation, risk control techniques with uh, the buses. Um, Pre-trip inspections and maintenance. This is another critical one too with obviously how many of the drivers actually do a walk around of the bus, look for vital components, uh, pre and post inspection. Obviously here, 
Um, something shorted, caused it a fire, and obviously we, now we've lost a bus. So again, these items are critical to obviously the auto and the transportation of your uh, students safely as well. Another huge one here, um, requiring drivers to back up. You should have a policy where the drivers never back up a bus. If they can always pull in, minimize the backing as much as possible. Here's uh, one here thing here. Driver missed the stop on a residential street, backed up to where the stop is, ran over a guy on a motorcycle. Okay. Again, don't know the whole story, where it happened at, but it, um, mirror adjustments. Did he look behind him? You know, how far was it? Was it 10 feet? Was it 20 feet? We don't know that. But again, try to minimize any type of backing for any type of bus transportations. <clears throat> so here with, uh, again, just if they had to, best practices, what to do, um, avoid it if all possible is obviously the biggest one. If a driver cannot avoid backing, plan it out to avoid the hazards and be aware of the things and activities that are going around their environment. How? Park where there is no need to back whenever possible. Um, you know, you pull into a bus yard, hopefully you can light them up where they don't have to back. Uh, use site, side backing if there's uh, no other choice. Avoid blindside backing, make sure mirrors are clean and adjusted properly. Uh, maintain constant awareness of the environment, use only re re reliable guides. Um, obviously, the traffic markings where you park your buses as well, help guide them into the spots. And obviously, um, the goal is a get out and look program if you guys have that too. It's a good program to have. It's called Goal, which is the last one. So get out and look. So another one here again. We've talked about this. Uh, failure to maintain clear distances and rear-end collisions. These are the ones that are preventable. Again, this is driver error. They're not paying attention. Maybe they got distracted in the back. But again, 39% involve buses striking other buses. What's that mean? How do buses leave the bus yards in the morning? Right behind each other, right? So again, do you have a following distance policy for your drivers when you're following another bus? Quarter mile, 500 feet, what is it? So that's something to be aware of. Obviously, 39% of losses pretty significant number from rear-ending another bus, okay? <clears throat> uh, let's see. This just gets into extending the damage of all bus collisions considering the number of students on the buses. Average paid loss is 226,000 versus 319 losses where buses struck private passenger vehicles and uh, far fewer claimants. So here if we look uh, bus collisions, and again, these are from our losses. Six buses involved in interstate crash. Uh, 260 students going to Six Flags. Again, a convoy of buses. The first one stops. They're following too close. Bam, bam, bam. You lose six buses. Not to mention injuring 260 students as well. Three buses involved, 9,800 students. Two lane state highway, three buses following each other. First bus stopped, picking up, turning left. Second, two buses hit them. Rear end collision, four way stop. Again, it goes on and on, okay? So, having and mandating a following policy for buses, especially when they're traveling in convoys, leaving in the morning, you need to be aware of that. <coughs> so, again, a lot of this. Uh, do you have a following distance policy in place? Is it four seconds to six seconds? Is it longer? You want to try to um, put something along these lines in place for your drivers, teaching that on an annual basis, part of the driver kickoff program. How many of us do a driver kickoff program every year? 
with our drivers. Any type of driver training every year? Something that something to think about. Uh, maintain adequate uh, vehicle spacing. Normal driving conditions allow one of the following uh, for every 10 feet of vehicle, one second, double or triple the distance in bad weather. So again, know this and have some type of policy put in place for following other buses. Again, failure to yield, um, driver error, following too close, not paying attention, distracted with the students in the back. Again, large number of losses, 20% uh, of losses attributed to left-handed turns. Pulling in front of somebody, not seeing a car coming. Running a, running a yellow light or a green light, red light, whatever, okay? So left turns in front of oncoming traffic, pulling from side roads in front of traffic, and disregarding uh, stop lights and stop signs is uh, the leading loss categories here. Rollover loss, loss control, obviously a um, lot of rural areas, animals run out. Again, teaching your drivers, it's better to hit the animal than try to avoid the animal. Or it's easier to go through the sign if you're heading, you know, lose control, you go off, go through the sign, not try to avoid the sign. Again. Not sure where this one was, lost control. I think this one here was, went off to the side, tried to overcorrect, came back, rolled the bus, struck a tree, okay? Again, significant loss. Best practices, again, driver training program. We should have that in place. Teach them not to panic, as we just said, um, you know, for animals. Unfortunately, try not to avoid them. Try to stop or drive through them. Uh, firm grip on the wheel, no gas or brakes. Ease bus back onto the road. And as we said before, it's better to hit it than uh, to try to avoid it. <clears throat> we talked about this too with bad weather. Allow better following distances, increase that. Uh, monitor it. How many of us monitor the weather? How many of your bus drivers monitor the weather, do you think? So if they know it's going to be colder out in the winter, do they come in and start their buses sooner? Or do they show up at 6.45 every day and leave at 6.50 every day and don't do a pre-trip inspection or anything along that lines? So this is some of the things you need to worry about and uh, practice and put in place as well. So loss of control. Uh, how, weather, slow down, stay off the roads, visible, windshields, lights, mirrors, watch for pedestrians. Now this is another one here with issues, uh, examples of other than uh, school buses, non-owned autos, student drivers, if you rent a box truck for something, okay? Um, here we're delivering band equipment, several people are hurt, student driving interstate cross country meet across the center line, rental vehicle collisions. So what happens? All right. So a lot of this time too, as far as extracurricular sports, you got your morning driver that did, got up at 6.30, started the route at 6.45, did an afternoon route came back, got to the school at 5.30, drove an hour and a half to the football game. Now it's 10.30 at night, and then they got to drive back an hour and a half. Does it happen? Sure it does. So again, is it time-wise? Do they get enough rest? What did they do throughout the day? Is your best driver that does this? How many of us actually check driver MVRs every year? for school bus? Nobody? Okay. Something you might want to think about. <laughs> okay. 
Who is actually driving your vehicles? You need to be aware of that. We need to check that. So here, this is again, one of the, uh, was 19% pedestrian strikes. And these are the unfortunate ones that occur. Um, obviously, most of the time, a lot of fatalities occur from this as well, okay? So 92% of the losses are pedestrian strikes of that 19% in that pie graph. 63% are fatalities, okay? Second largest total incurred and average paid per loss. Obviously, uh, fatalities is, is huge. Um, what precautions are you taking in training your drivers for this gets in onloading procedures, uh, practices. So pedestrian strikes, I'm not going to run through these. Um, but here, you know, we'll take this one right here. Should vehicle drop student off, student exited the bus, walked up the bank of the side of the road, and then I rear-ended the path of the, uh, path of the bus um, when it began moving forward. Fatality of a 10-year-old student. Okay, it happens. A lot of the time, the driver, they leave the bus. Okay, on to the next drop or pickup. They don't pay attention. Bring all their controls in, their uh, control arms. They see them run up. Okay, great. Should close the door, turn the lights off, and move forward. Okay, so again, being aware of your surroundings, you got kids in the back that are yelling. So again, their, their attention is not focused 100% on their driving. So again, I'm not going to run through all these, but it happens quite often. So recognizing danger zones, obviously 10 foot around the bus, okay? Most dangerous. You know, obviously here oncoming traffic as well, that's another huge one. Um, with, with pedestrian strikes for uh, oncoming motorists. But again, the walking area, uh, how far should they cross in front of the bus when they do cross. Um, so the danger zones, drivers need to be aware of that. So again, 10 feet, then it gets into extend 30 feet from the front bumper, first 10 feet is the most dangerous. Onloading at a bus stop, anybody have this procedure in place or do the training? So again, one, two, three, and four, perform a safe stop in the designated um, onload loading areas, wherever. Students remain seated, told, told the exit, check all the mirrors, count the number of students. Before pulling away from the stop, the driver should check all mirrors, make sure no students are around. Uh, when all students cannot be accounted for outside the bus, secure the bus, check under and beneath the bus. Okay, so do they count three students left? I see where all three students are. I proceed to move forward. When all students are accounted for, prepare to leave, close the door, engage transmission, release brake, turn off flashing lights, and then when safe, move the bus, entering back into the flow of traffic. Anybody have or go through policies like that? Okay, so again, this is a huge uh, concern that we have to, to focus on. And then pedestrian strikes on loading at the school. There, had, again, has been incidents here. Um, as we'll see here, state and local laws, you need to know them. Uh, the school bus driver must understand and obey the state and laws. Follow procedures and implement as general guidelines for the drivers to follow. So again, from this, a lot of us have some work to do as far as driver training, knowing who's driving the, our, our school buses or other vehicles, and then take what you've learned today and educate your drivers, communicate to the drivers. We have a lot of resources that we can provide as well. Um, Pat and then Mike and Nate and everyone has access to that as well. Any questions you guys may have?
All right. Thank you.